All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome uh, to the Bobotnik School of Government virtually. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to the panel on the politics of vaccine development and delivery. And uh, good afternoon to those of you here in Europe. Good morning to those of you in the United States and good evening to those of you joining um, from Asia. So a mere five months ago, the collective might of much of the world's scientific community was focused on the development of a vaccine for the novel coronavirus. And in the past few months, indeed the past few weeks, we've seen some of the most advanced candidates for a vaccine um, to the novel coronavirus uh, share some promising news, um, which makes it possible um, for a vaccine to be developed if, if all goes to plan. And of course, that's still very much open to question within a calendar year of the initial genetic sequencing of this coronavirus. But in the delight over this fantastic news and the enormous progress that's currently being made, it's also tempting to think that a return to normalcy is just around the corner. But between the discovery of an efficacious vaccine and an inoculated population lies the vexing problem of vaccine production and vaccine distribution, what some observers have called vaccine nationalism. And that's what we're here today to discuss. So I'm joined by a star-studded panel representing a, just a wealth of experience in the world of vaccine discovery and distribution. So uh, we are, have four panelists, I will take them in turn and we'll first turn to John Arna Rottingen, who's the Chief Executive of the Research Council of Norway and a professor at the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard University. He was the uh, founding Chief Executive of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, known as CEPI. He's also served in various public health capacities at the WHO and in the Norwegian government. He's also, I'm delighted to say, uh, a new colleague at the Bobotnik School of Government here at Oxford. After uh, John Arno, we'll turn to Samia Swaminathan, who is the chief scientist at the World Health Organization. Dr. Swaminathan has also served as a secretary to the government of India for health research. And she's focused on bringing a, a wealth of experience in um, in her 30 years as a practicing pediatrician um, into health policy making for the Indian government. After that, we'll turn to Rajiv Benkaya, who's the president of the Global Vaccine Business Unit at Takeda Pharmaceutical, where he's led on the development of vaccines such as dengue, norovirus, and Zika. He's also previously served as the director of vaccine delivery at the Gates Foundation um, and as a special assistant to the president of the United States in the capacity of, um, of public health. And then finally, we'll turn to Chelsea Clinton, who is the vice chair of the Clinton Foundation and who works on a very broad portfolio of issues that includes a range of public health issues. Dr. Clinton also teaches at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. So their, their bios are there for you, their fuller bios are there for you to take a look at. But let me just jump right in by asking John Arna to give us a quick overview of where we currently stand in uh, the world of the vaccine research. So John Arna, over to you. Um, I think you're muted. Too eager, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being part of this excellent panel and, and thanks for a nice introduction, Maya. Uh, so uh, in a way, the world knew that this would happen. Um, a year ago, uh, it happened. Uh, we, we have known for many years that new viruses will arise uh, and that we need to be prepared for them. And we know that these new viruses, we really do not have the necessary technologies to handle them. We can call them disease X, so the unknown diseases that will arise due to increasing pressures on nature, due to climate, uh, urbanization, and, and larger environmental changes. In classical terms, we normally use the traditional public health measures to control epidemics. It's, it's back to the yeah, hundreds and thousands of years ago. 
But now in modern times, we also use what we call biomedical countermeasures. And, and in particular, those are diagnostics, therapeutics, so treatments, and vaccines. And in many ways, vaccines is the key technology because we all know that that is what can take us out of the all these extra public health measures that our societies now go through. So the world is eagerly waiting for a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine to come uh, and be approved. Uh, and it's the only viable exit strategy, as I mentioned, for most countries. The challenge, though, is that the average time to develop a vaccine is around seven to eight years. Um, uh, and that's rather ambitious. Uh, and we have many experiences on, on failures and the challenges related to vaccine development. And it needs to go through several phases. First, we need to understand the biology of the virus and the host response. And of course, for a new disease like uh, COVID-19 or the SARS-2 coronavirus, uh, it's something new we need to learn. Then we need to develop vaccine candidates, so specific vaccines that first need to then be tested in preclinical models, so in animals, before they can be used in humans. And then when they are ready to be used in humans, they need to go to three phases of clinical testing, what we call phase one, two, and three, before they finally can be approved through often emergency measures. Since January, we have seen an unprecedented, both collaborative and, I should say, competitive set of activities uh, to actually do now really increase the speed of vaccine development. It's first and foremost a competition against the clock, but we should also not diminish that it's a competition against other actors, other candidates. It's a race. The speed of action, I would say, is partly facilitated uh, by the fact that we had established a rather new and young organization called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, that could start investing in COVID-19 vaccine candidates all, already just a couple of weeks after the gene sequence was published uh, in mid-January. Uh, um, today, according to the World Health Organization, we have 25 different vaccines that are already in clinical development, and that's unprecedented and an enormous success. And in addition, there are about 140 other candidates in preclinical stage of development. And these vaccines, they cut across all kinds of different so-called vaccine technology platforms. So they are the standard old, tradition, uh, old traditional vaccines that are inactivated viruses. There are new recombinant viral vaccines where we put genes from the new virus, so the COVID-19 virus, into already established uh, uh, viral vaccines. There are protein subunits vaccines, and there are the genetic sequence-based vaccines, DNA and RNA vaccines. So we use the full arsenal of different opportunities. And just in the last couple of weeks, we have seen full scientific reports on at least three vaccine candidates, the so-called Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, the Chinese CanSino vaccine, and the Moderna vaccine. The first two are uh, recombinant viral vaccines, and the last is the um, so-called mRNA vaccine. And these vaccines, all three of them, give promising results in phase one and two trials. They gave, gives both so-called humoral and cellular immune responses. And an immune response is really key to mount protection. And this means that the uh, vaccines, they uh, establish both neutralizing antibodies in volunteers that have been vaccinated, as well as the so-called T cell responses. And we believe we need both. However, so far, we really do not know what kind of immune response that will be needed to protect against the infection, or at least protect against serious disease. And that is why we now wait for results from the phase three studies, the last phase of clinical testing. Uh, and these have started in several countries, and they include the UK, the US, Brazil, and South Africa. And if we are lucky, results may come already late fall in November or December this year. So on an optimistic note, uh, we would then actually be able to develop as a world community. And I think we should consider this as a world community, a vaccine that is proven safe and effective only in the time span of a year since the viral genome was released on January the 12th, 2020. 
However, the world needs billions of vaccine doses at that stage. Manufacturing of complex biological products like vaccines are challenging. They need a lot of technical know-how and need technical infrastructures and large facilities to, to produce at this scale. And normally it will take at least a year from planning to actually producing the first lot of such a vaccine when starting from scratch. And at least six to nine months if the uh, infrastructure or the facilities are already established. So this is why several countries now have already started to procure millions of doses of vaccine candidates that are under development, but still we do not know whether they will work. So this at-risk procurement has never happened before, but it's really important to make sure that we will have at least uh, a decent amount of vaccine doses uh, already early in 2021. But this that may challenge the goal of equitable access to the vaccines, because we know that it's first and foremost the large high-income countries who are able to make these pre-procurement deals with companies already at this stage. And this leaves both smaller high-income countries and upper middle-income countries, as well as the lower uh, middle-income countries and low-income countries in a very uncertain position on when they will be able to ac access vaccines when the, they are hopefully documented safe and effective. To try to do something about that challenge, uh, it, the, the so-called Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator has been established from the initiative of the World Health Organizations and Heads of State. And the COVAX partnership is the vaccine pillar under that initiative. We really need international collaborative efforts to make sure that we can deliver vaccines to all. So to sum it up, we've never done better as a global community than now. But there are many challenges, many dilemmas that need to be addressed urgently in the coming months. And I look forward to the discussions on this panel. Banana, thank you so much for, for that really comprehensive um, overview of, of where we are now. So because we are really focused on the politics of, of production and delivery, I'm going to turn next to Somia and then and Rajiv and Chelsea in turn uh, with the same question. And the question is, let's assume for a moment that a vaccine is actually found. Now, what it does and how long it's efficacious for, let's leave those questions for the moment aside. And the question I'd like to turn over to you now, Somia, with is, what aspect of vaccine production or delivery are you most concerned about and why? Thank you, Maya. Let me take off from where uh, John Arne left off and the reason why the ACT Accelerator was conceptualized and formed. In 2009-10, when we had the H1N1 pandemic, the situation when vaccines were developed was that the high income, a handful of high income countries had bought up most of the available doses with very little left for the rest of the world. And it was only after a period of time when they realized that perhaps the pandemic wasn't as bad as it could have been and that they didn't need all of those vaccine doses that they then started donating these doses to be distributed among the countries which had not you know, purchase them, so the lower middle income countries. Now, that's the grave danger today. There's a choice before the world. One is to see equitable distribution of available doses. And we are going to have limited doses. Let's face the reality. The world has never made doses billions in the billions. And so at the beginning, we're going to have, if we're lucky, and again, there's a big if there because the clinical trials are still ongoing, but let's say that couple of vaccines prove to be safe and efficacious and they can be scaled up. We have a few hundred million doses in the middle by the middle of next year. How are those going to be distributed? If, for example, the United States and the European Union bought up enough vaccine doses for that to cover their entire population, that's like 1.7 billion already we're talking about because most of the vaccines are going to need two doses. That doesn't leave very much for anyone else. Um, and so what we're proposing through the COVAX initiative and the facility is let's share what's available equitably 
because we need to protect those who are at highest risk. It doesn't matter where they live, high income or low income countries. So these could be healthcare workers, frontline workers, others who are at high risk of morbidity and mortality. We know who those risk groups are. Could vary a little bit in different parts of the world, but let's first share the vaccine to vaccinate those people so they can still take care of the sick. The, the health systems do not collapse. And then as more and more doses become available, countries can vaccinate larger parts of the population. So how do you do this? Um, the ACT Accelerator was launched by uh, Dr. Tedros, Melinda Gates, and the presidents of France and the European Union in order to accelerate the development of diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, but not just accelerate R&D. It was to ensure equitable access. It's very much built into that. And so everything we do is with that angle. So for vaccines, it's CEPI uh, that you just heard about from Yon Arne and uh, Gavi, the vaccine alliance that, that just procures and distributes vaccines to low middle income countries. They have about 78 countries currently in their, uh, in their ambit, but this may increase a little bit for the COVID vaccines. And, and then WHO. And so, so I don't want to go into a lot of details now. We've done a lot already to facilitate the R&D on the normative side, you know, creating the the enabling sciences, the, the, all the tests and, uh, and this protocols and, and things you need for the trials. But more importantly, or as important, is the COVAX facility. And the, it's a, the concept is very simple. You have a pooled mechanism to pool risk. So as far as countries are concerned, if they invest in the COVAX facility, they're pooling their risk because this facility is investing in many candidates. We don't know which ones are going to succeed. So if all countries cannot buy you know, 10 or 12 candidates. So they may bet on one or two, and if those fail, then they're left with nothing. But from the COVAX facility, you're pooling that risk. You're also pooling the market um, um, the, the, on the demand side and, and pooling procurement so you can get uh, better pricing and companies are assured of a certain amount of volume that, that will be guaranteed. So it's really a win-win for all. Currently, we have about 78 high-income and upper-middle-income countries that have expressed an interest in this facility. Uh, they still haven't made binding commitments. These countries would be expected to pay for the doses of the vaccine that they get. Um, and, and the remaining countries, as I said, there may be about 90 countries that Gavi would supply vaccines to, would have to come from overseas development aid, which would also go into the COVAX facility. So it would service the whole world, but some countries would be paying for their vaccine doses, but they would be assured of getting the vaccines which prove to be safe and efficacious at the, at the earliest possible time. So we, we think that's a win-win and um, it, it, it shows a lot of global solidarity. There's been uh, quite a fair amount of political support for this, but this now needs to translate into those binding commitments which is expected by the end of August. So we have a limited time window because the earlier the, the resources are available, the more the advanced market commitments, the more the manufacturing investments can be done. Because the last point I want to make, and of course Rajiv would say much more about that, is traditional vaccine development takes a long time because you go through all these phases of testing and then the, the developers, the companies only start scaling manufacturing when they know the vaccine works. In this case, we are saying no. We have to start investing the capacity to manufacture well before we know whether the vaccines are actually going to work. So you need those, those resources in the COVAX. And I, I could come back later to, to more details uh, about that. Thank you, Samia. So, so you've said that the getting countries at this stage to sign up to this, these risk pooling mechanisms and commit to them is, is what you're most concerned about. And you, you sit at the WHO. Rajiv, you sit in the world of the pharmaceutical industry. And, and so from your perspective, is that right? Is, it, is that what you're most concerned about is, is creating the kind of risk pooling, um, uh, getting countries to actually commit to pool risk in such a way that um, when a vaccine is developed, if and when it's, um, it's, it's shared equitably. Um, is that what you're most concerned about? 
It's a very real and, and one of the most important considerations, actually, because we want to make sure that all countries have access to vaccines when they become available. And it's really not possible for most countries to enter into single company agreements when products are in development because they have no guarantee that that vaccine, in fact, will be proven to be safe and efficacious. So <clears throat> Samia has done a, a wonderful job <clears throat> of explaining of explaining the the, the benefits of that kind of pooling. But I want to I want to take a, a step back and build upon what uh, John Arne nicely um, explained, which is the the role of substantial public private partnerships to advance multiple vaccines and development. And I want to start with what are we trying to accomplish in the midst of this pandemic, we need to have ideally multiple safe and effective vaccines that have not just been shown to be safe and effective. They need to be available in sufficient supply quickly so that we can immunize as many people around the world as possible and ideally put an end or, or mitigate the impact to this pandemic. Now, how are we going to get there? This is perhaps one of the biggest questions that, that many people have. If uh, you're telling us that a vaccine normally takes seven or eight years or longer to develop, how exactly are you going to do this without compromising on your assessments of safety and efficacy? And I think here it's useful to unpack what exactly is being done. So normally in the development of a vaccine, as John Arne suggested, you go in sequence. You do preclinical work, meaning before you take the vaccine into human into people. Then you do phase one, phase two, phase three, larger and larger phase, uh, larger and larger trials to demonstrate that the vaccine actually works and ultimately that it protects against infection. When we talk about acceleration, we're talking about doing things in all of these areas in parallel. So when you are in phase one, you're planning for your phase two and your phase three, and you're doing what can sometimes take the longest in vaccine development, which is getting ready for large scale vaccine manufacturing. And as Samia has said, what we're asking vaccine manufacturers to do is to begin that manufacturing scale up from the time that you're actually in phase one. This never happens in traditional vaccine development because it would be a very risky maneuver. The likelihood of success for a vaccine that is in phase one development is less than 20%. So why would you invest in manufacturing facilities and why would you start building large volumes of inventory if there's only a 20% or less chance that this vaccine is even going to be successful? That is the risk that we're talking about managing in this environment. That one way we're managing that risk is to fund companies to do that R&D. We're also funding companies to start to build inventory before the data is available. So it's only a short period of time between data availability and when we can actually supply vaccine. The last thing I will say is uh, that um, having multiple quote unquote shots on goal is another very, very important way to mitigate risk. But to have so many shots on goal, you need to um, support companies to take the risk to enter into a very big pool of other competitors. And, and at the end of all of this, we're going to, as we expect, have significant supplies of vaccine. It's important, though, to explain what we will know about those vaccines and what we don't know. We do expect that we will have very good evidence of efficacy and safety for those vaccines that are licensed because they will have gone into large phase three clinical trials that are similar in size to the normal phase three clinical trials that we use, conduct during normal clinical development. What we will not know is how long the protection lasts from a given vaccine. We call that durability of protection. And there may be instances where very rare side effects could occur with a vaccine. And in a trial that has 30,000 individuals, that might not be big enough to pick up that very rare side effect. And it may not be until you go into millions of people that you pick up something like that. And here, it's going to be very important that we as a community share that data on what is happening after we launch these vaccines, including any uh, events that are what we call adverse events, so that everyone understands what is happening with these vaccines and the overall profile of not only effectiveness, but also safety. And maybe I'll just stop there, Maya, I'm looking forward to discussing that further. Great. So, so in addition to, to Somia's point about pooling the risk uh, or uh, creating mechanisms to ensure equitable, equitable distribution, you're sort of bringing us also to uh, pay attention to the fact that that we don't know a lot of the side effects of whatever vaccine will come 
to to the market and um, and and that actually sharing information um, and perhaps pooling institutionally in such a way that we um, can maybe compensate those who are who are the real losers. So let's let's come back to that point. Um, I want to turn now to um, to Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, you have you wear two different hats. You you have a kind of foundational hat. You you, you sit on the the vice chair of the Clinton Foundation, but you also teach at a school of public health. And so from the perspective of those two hats, what are you most concerned about when it comes to vaccine uh, delivery and production? Well, I certainly um, you know, echo the, the concerns around um, both having kind of sufficient manufacturing capacity uh, to kind of meet whatever the science delivers. And I do think, you know, as, as John Arno and others you know, have already said, you know, this is kind of unprecedented in the history of humanity. We've never kind of had kind of so many people kind of racing um, kind of toward a, toward a, a common goal. Um, and yet also kind of as, as Rajiv acknowledged, um, kind of merely kind of the, the science itself will not be sufficient to ensure that we're able to kind of protect um, kind of individuals or, or populations sufficiently and I'm deeply concerned about kind of the all the questions around equity and, and my what you raised around um, kind of the vaccine nationalism you know especially since you know I'm sitting here in the United States uh, you know um, I think a month after the Trump administration brought all of the world supply of remdesivir for the entire month of July and 90 percent of the world supply for August and September um, so I feel this keenly you know, as an American, because I do not believe that my government at the moment is doing its part to help protect um, kind of the, the front lines of the world, you know, as, as Somia so eloquently said of our, our health workers really around the world. And I would also argue if we're going to continue to prioritize getting kids in school, our teachers. Um, and yet one of the other things that I'm very concerned about as we've discussed um, that hasn't really been talked about today um, is, is the need kind of for, for a real kind of robust effort starting now along the lines of what kind of Rajiv said, being completely um, kind of transparent, not only about kind of the process of vaccine development, but kind of whatever we will continue to learn as more people are um, inoculated. Um, because we know that only kind of through that robust transparency will we be able to um, kind of cultivate and, and build the trust that will be so critical to ensuring that people not only are kind of first in line to get vaccinated, but continue um, to get vaccinated. And, you know, I think this is especially important now because we have a lot of um, information, sadly, that um, misinformation around uh, vaccines really has uh, been effective in dissuading people um, from vaccinating themselves or their children. Um, not just here in the United States, but kind of on the other end of the world, in Australia, you know, in the UK, where you're sitting, my, and a lot of the world, kind of this rising vaccine hesitancy, which WHO kind of has called one of kind of the 10 greatest threats facing kind of global public health. You know, it's a very real challenge and, and, and unfortunately has only grown as a challenge in the last few months. So kind of, uh, you know, a number of people have said, you know, yeah, I always get my flu vaccine or of course I vaccinated, you know, my children um, against measles, you know, but I don't trust the Trump administration or I don't trust the speed at which this is happening or, you know, I, I want to wait and see. Um, we have to be listening to people today, but also engaging with those concerns today because we actually want everyone to be standing in line. I mean, my mother remembers I'm um, standing in line for six hours to get vaccinated against polio as a little girl and like how excited her mother, my grandmother was, that her children were finally going to be able to go to the pool in the summer. Kind of the local movie theaters were finally going to be open because kind of this awful scourge had an answer. Um, we don't have that type of even kind of um, national willingness and readiness and kind of solidarity. And we certainly don't have it at a global level. And this is really where um, the last thing I'll say is not only do we need kind of public health people stepping into the breach more kind of effectively, we need kind of the social media platforms around the world to take responsibility for this. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has said repeatedly, the only thing that Facebook takes down kind of our very specific threats. Well, I think um, vaccine misinformation and malinformation is, is a very specific threat to, to global public health. And I think we have to be putting more pressure 
um, on especially kind of Facebook, with Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, on Google, with YouTube, uh, to not only demonetize all of the anti-vaccine information which they've done, but to really, to really take it down. Um, because it is so antithetical to, um, to public health and it does pose a very clear and, and imminent threat. Thank you. I mean, Chelsea, I'm just going to return to you with another question here. Um, so you, you've highlighted the role that trust plays in mediating between vaccine discovery and distribution in the way that it did for polio. Um, and we also know uh, one of the few things that we know actually uh, about the kind of political response to COVID is that governments that were trusted by their citizens were much more effective at, um, at containing it and uh, implementing test, trace and isolate strategies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the role of trust we're increasingly learning is, is, is critical, not just in vaccine and in, in maintaining, preventing, um, maintaining public health and preventing pandemics from um, becoming um, bigger and bigger, but, there, but the role of trust is, is, is also critical, going to be critical when, if and when a vaccine is developed in, um, in seeing immunity develop um, at a broad level. So um, what, you know, you, you've mentioned the role of social media perhaps and taking a more active role to combat disinformation. Are there other things that you can think of that you can suggest both from your public role, uh, health hat uh, perspective and from the perspective of, of your, uh, your foundation? Um, what, what kinds of things do we need to be doing to improve trust in governments um, that, that can, can, can see them more effectively responding? And if others wanna jump in here, um, uh, please, please feel free to jump in. Well, I think this is such a, um... A hard question just to be completely again kind of uh, transparent and, and candid about you know for me you know as an American sitting here in the United States because you know there are um, many things on which I do not trust the current Trump administration um, to put it mildly and you know I mean earlier this week um, the president you know retweeted um, a, a series of things not only once again kind of advocating for hydroxychloroquine, despite like now multiple um, RCTs and double blind studies proving that it is not kind of an efficacious uh, response here to COVID, to highlighting a pediatrician in Houston who, you know, among her kind of her own social media presence has declared kind of uh, everything from one of the major sources of disease is kind of dreams with uh, demons and kind of women who get kind of impregnated with demonic sperm and that that kind of makes us more vulnerable to illness. So, I mean, it is challenging at this moment when we have kind of the president of the United States, you know, trafficking in and amplifying um, conspiracy theories and kind of things that are so uh, untethered to kind of science or facts or, or evidence and, and sometimes now even contra to science facts and kind of evidence. Um, that being said, I do think um, we have to be able to hold that simultaneously alongside, you know, trust in the National Institutes of Health and trust in kind of the, the process that uh, Dr. Fauci is leading, trust in kind of how transparent the NIH has been with its partnership with Moderna, kind of trust in kind of everything that they're saying about kind of um, the monitoring of the trials that are happening in the United States. And we have to be able to have those, those coexist while also acknowledging there are very good reasons why people do not trust um, kind of in the American government at this moment. Um, and you said, you know, governments that had trust were more likely to succeed in kind of test, trace, and isolate. Um, we never tried here, right? We, we never had a national strategy. We still don't have a national strategy. Um, and, and so I think it is, it is hard and yet we have to be able to do that because we do kind of need people um, to not only kind of be kind of armchair epidemiologists, which it seems like so many people in America are right now, but actually listening to kind of the scientists and listening to kind of hopefully people with the same clarity as you've heard kind of the panelists here describe about kind of where we are in the science, where we are in the process. Um, because we also need people, candidly, Maya, in wealthy countries to say, like, we will wait to get vaccinated, right? 
you know, yeah. we, will, we will wait so that the front line of the world can be protected because we know that is in our interest too. So we have to be able to navigate this very kind of challenging terrain. And I think part of our ability to navigate it is dependent upon the same type of kind of robust honesty and, and, and clarity um, and transparency that hopefully kind of you're hearing today. So Rajiv, you're also um, sitting in the United States and you, you know, you've worked in the White House, you've worked at the Gates Foundation, all, and now you're in the business sector. So you've, you've moved through various sectors on this, uh, working on vaccines. I mean, what do you think about the role of trust in, in mediating vaccine distribution? You know, our, our team at the White House uh, wrote the first national strategy for pandemic influenza. And at that time, we thought about all the ways we could fail. Uh, we never considered that we might fail because people did not believe in science. And this is something that may be seen by some as being a fringe issue. But for the reasons Chelsea suggested, that's no longer the case. You know, 10 years ago, if you had an idea that wasn't founded in science, that idea would not gain traction because a person would talk about it to other people and very quickly logic would prevail and the idea would not go further. Social media is like uh, taking a spark and pouring gasoline or petrol on it continuously, driving it further and further into people's consciousness until it actually reaches the mainstream and leads smart people to question everything. My fear is that when we do the retrospective on this pandemic, for all the good things that social media has done, and I certainly participate in social media, on social media platforms, that it could also be seen as one of the most important drivers of science denialism or anti-science perspectives. And ultimately anything that's anti-science is pro-virus and will support propagation of the pandemic. And I think for that reason, we all, including social media companies, need to prioritize this over just about everything else. And, and can I just say by a quickly, um, and then I know there's so much else we want to talk about, you know, there was a study published in Nature a couple months ago that looked at kind of the, the ecosystem of information on, on Facebook uh, last year around, around measles. Um, because sadly, we've had, and not again, just in the US, but really around the world, a, a kind of a specific rejection of the MMR vaccine because of um, really the great uh, evil of Dr. Uh, Andrew Wakefield, who I really think is one of the kind of greatest villains of our time for his, you know, now multiply debunked study in the Lancet, um, you know, more than 20 years ago, uh, where he fraudulently kind of contrived data linking the MMR vaccine to um, autism. And like just so painfully, you know, as this study literally kind of maps over 2019, kind of in these conversations around measles, looking at more than 100 million Facebook users with billions and billions of kind of posts and impressions across them, you know, the um, kind of misinformation, malinformation, disinformation around um, both kind of measles as like not being a serious disease, um, you know, say that to the, um, parents who lost you know, more than 100,000 kids to measles around the world last year, um, but also the kind of misinformation about the vaccine itself, you know, was shared orders of magnitude more than kind of pro-public health messaging around, like, here's actually why you should think measles is concerning. Here's why, why vaccines, this vaccine specifically, like, is safe. So like we are, we, you know, it's not just as, as Rajesh said, like on the fringes, it is, it is permeated and consumed the conversation online in a way that I think, you know, we haven't paid enough attention to, and we are now really suffering the consequences of, because we are seeing that same dynamic play out on the platforms around a COVID vaccine before we even have the science settled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the, interesting things is it's come up, you know, several of you have mentioned it here on the panel. It's also coming up, by the way, in, in some of the questions. Um, we have a question from Arundam about how you mitigate conspiracy theories. And, and I, I hear multiple of you refer, many of you referring to social media platforms as, as a kind of key part of that, um, of that of that equation. So, you know, uh, the UK is a country where um, we've seen actually a, a little bit of a turnaround um, from, from 
uh, a government that came to power uh, in the aftermath of Brexit saying, you know, we've had enough of experts to a government, uh, a government at least from the same party that has said, um, you know, we're very much following the science. So John Arna, you know, you you are um, very close to the science, and you also come from a country, Norway, that has a very high levels of trust in government. So, can you just do you have a you know do, what can you tell us about the way in which uh, trust in government has 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 worked in Norway to facilitate um, kind of effective uh, public health interventions and um, and anything else you might add from your your time at um, at uh, SEPI. Oh, thank you, and I'm pleased to do so. Um, I used to be sort of head of infection control and vaccination programs in Norway in a previous role. And, and of course, we also have vaccine hesitancy, uh, probably not at the level uh, in, in some of the other countries, including the US uh, and in, in particular currently. Uh, but the only response we, we found that was really sustainable uh, in, in sort of uh, trying to counteract that was information, 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 being transparent, being, being real, and, and always using facts and science uh, as the base for information. Um, and now as a research funder, um, we do national polls on the trust in science in general. And interestingly, so um, in general, trust in science has been high in Norway, and, and it's also similar in some other Northern European countries, but it has even increased now during the spring uh, and during the pandemic. Uh, see a 5% points increase uh, from a bit less than 80 to around 85% sort of general trust in science in the public. And my reading of this is that we have never seen such a broad coverage of scientific and research questions in media. And, and this has, uh, it's been made very clear to people that without knowledge, without science and research to get that knowledge and without using that knowledge to produce technologies and interventions that can work. Uh, we, we have no, uh, no sort of arsenal, no, no weapons to, to counter a pandemic. And I, I, I think it's very heartening to see such increase in trust. But I, I probably, uh, but I, I'm also very sort of disheartened to, to see the situation in the US. And and I guess it's it, it's very much about the starting point. Do you already have mistrust in government? Do you all already have a very partisan sort of politics system? Uh, both sides of, of the political spectrum may use a situation like this to destabilize, uh, unfortunately, and, and then use non-scientific uh, sort of uh, positions to, to, to actually just destabilize instead of coming with the real information. Um, and you can either have vicious circles in countries, and I think we have that uh, b before, when a country doesn't really, are not able to fully mount the public health response that is needed. Of course, that can be the trust. It, in some sense, it's the, the, the reason to have some mistrust in, in government is there, but then it's starting a vicious circle. And I think uh, the, a virtual circle where you can actually demonstrate that governmental and public health measures do have an impact. Of course, it, it's interrelated. So it's it's a complex issue. It's not uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. So Mia, can I turn to you now? Um, and I'm gonna ping to you actually a question that we've gotten, um, which is about um, the relative role of uh, vaccine discovery and distribution versus what um, investment in, in uh, prevention. Um, so that's from Wendy Crocker. Um, so the question really is about what should governments be doing? Um, and, and given that there are trade-offs financially in terms of resources, how much should governments invest in um, vaccine development and distribution versus investment in the simple trust, trace and isolate um, capacities that, that many governments haven't still gotten um, fully up and running and which was at the, the core of the WHO recommendation um, for the early months of the, of the pandemic outbreak? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, I don't think it's either this or that. Um, we, I think all recognize that a vaccine is probably the best way out of this pandemic. Because if we are able to immunize enough people and create that herd immunity, then you can break transmission. And the virus will not disappear. I think uh, scientists have also now said, we might have to live with this virus, just like we live with many other viruses. But it won't cause the kind of complete breakdown 
of you know normal life as it is doing today um, it becomes a manageable thing and it, it you know you, countries and their health systems can cope with it so i think we we need the vaccine and we need the investment in vaccine development and also in procuring enough doses and making sure the, the world is vaccinated we still don't have answers as was previously pointed out about the duration of protection and so at this point we don't know if this is a one time vaccine you have to get it every year every two years so that's something we need to figure out but coming to the other preventive social and public health measures we know what works it is very difficult to do all the things that actually work so you have to keep people apart because this virus needs person to person contact to spread and anywhere that that happens especially if it's prolonged close contact and there's an infected person there it jumps to many people and so the measures that countries have put in place um to 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 maintain the physical distancing the masking the, the respiratory etiquette the hand hygiene but also the the changes in uh, in the way that things are done in remote working you know reducing crowds uh, not congregating you know public transport everything that we know uh, in our day to day life has had to be uh, done differently that's a big challenge both for individuals and for governments but that's the only thing that that works we know that you have to test you have to know where your infection is you have to be prepared to to go and contact trace and though we have a lot of digital uh, apps and things that are that have been promoted we we all know that the apps alone do not substitute for actual field workers going out and doing contact tracing and then making sure people are quarantined so to get back to the question of do you need to invest in prevention very much i think countries need to invest in prevention in public health and surveillance capacities this has been said repeatedly and i think john arne said at the beginning a pandemic was expected and and the dg i think was asked last uh, november dr tedros what keeps him up at night and he said uh, a pandemic uh, he was thinking about an influenza pandemic but um the so people around the world have known that that this is likely and we haven't invested enough now if, if you look at the losses around the world it's running into trillions of dollars if you if you add up the economic losses uh, and countries are investing huge amounts into their own economies you know both to to support people who are suffering now but also to get businesses and economies up and running and if a fraction of that could be invested in 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 the vaccine i mean the the vaccine pillar of the act accelerator is asking for 32 billion dollars which is a fraction of the trillions that are being lost and what have we got so far we've got 3.4 billion that's it so we're far away from the goal of having enough to even do the vaccine bit that we promised and our goal is to have 2 billion doses of the vaccine by end of 2021 we can't do that without the resources and on the other hand you need countries to invest in public health and one thing that's been made starkly clear is that even high income countries where we expect health systems to be very good and generally we there they are very good the tertiary healthcare systems their public health response has not been as robust and that's led to this huge explosion of cases and the overburdening of the health systems and now even countries like germany and others uk hired contact tracers hundreds of contact tracers thousands to actually do this work meticulous work which is needed for good public health response so i think all countries have learned lessons high income middle income low income and of course we need to support the low and middle income countries more in the future uh, by by making sure that they investing in the right uh, health systems and again to go back to what who always says that universal health coverage and preparedness for emergencies are two sides of the same coin and so if you're promoting universal health coverage it means that you're also taking care of 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 surveillance of prevention of detection and of response because let's be clear this is not the last pandemic the world is going to have and in fact the chances are that this kind of event could happen more frequently in the future because of all all of the other environmental issues that, that are happening around the world uh, and 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 destruction of habitats and you know it's a one health issue so 
So we have to prepare for the next one, even as we're getting ourselves out of this one. And, uh, and we need to overall invest much more in, in health. Great, so Rajiv, let me turn to you because there are a lot of questions coming through on the chat that have to do with the business model, elements of the business model um, of how we, how we think about not only developing the vaccine, but the role of intellectual property. So we have Daniel asking about um, vaccine access for middle income countries, which we're, we've heard a little bit about that. We have Zane asking, why are we not requiring corporations to share knowledge? Why are we not requiring that? Um, we have Tanya asking about the dependence um, on drug manufacturers in a variety of countries and how that will affect access. Um, and I think that what one thing that ties these various questions together is maybe you can you can um, at, you can walk us through what you think the business model is. So the traditional business model, right, tried to solve for the problem of huge R&D costs up front and uncertain payoffs by guaranteeing intellectual property rights. Is that the problem here? It seems like we might be seeing something different in the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Maya. One thing that people may not really appreciate on the intellectual property and patent side is that while these patents can be very important in medicines, meaning pharmaceutical products, drugs, as well as in diagnostics, they play less of a role in vaccine development and um, support for uh, new vaccines. The, the real barriers to development are, of vaccines are the, the time, the risk, the expense that goes into developing a vaccine. We've talked about the long time horizons and the significant capital investments that are necessary. So I can tell you as a, somebody in a company that's working on vaccines, I spend very little of my time worrying about patents because they're not the reason that it's hard to develop vaccine. So no one should have the impression that if you make patents freely available on vaccines, that that's going to meaningfully change the vaccine landscape, at least the way it's been done, it's been handled previously. Now, in the in light of the new platform technologies, for example, messenger RNA vaccines, you do have a number of companies that are working on similar platforms. And it's possible that in the future, intellectual property for those platforms will become more of, a, of an issue than it has been. But let's let's come back to the, the business model. You know, here we have a situation where the world, through its governments, wants to ensure that it gets a safe and effective vaccine, hopefully more than one, in large volumes quickly. Now, we could choose to use the existing business model, but we know what would happen. We know most companies would see it as too risky uh, and not want to get into such a crowded competitive uh, uh, space and just divert their attention from other areas where they're working on important things. And so we probably wouldn't get a vaccine for quite some time. What we're saying is that we need to have that vaccine developed quickly. We want multiple players. The way we need to do that is to pay for it. And, and that is typically through investments in R&D and then also to ensure that that large supply is available as quickly as possible to fund the raw materials, the inventory buildup, so that um, we have that warehouse full of vaccines that are ready to go and st help stop the pandemic as soon as we have the data on safety and efficacy. If I look at the publicly disclosed numbers on investments in companies, these seem like pretty big numbers. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars potentially going to companies. Um, there, if you if you look at that relative to how, what pharmaceutical companies are typically doing in their day-to-day -day business, I can tell you that no large pharmaceutical company is really going to be making uh, a huge um, business success out of this. The large companies are doing this because their family members are suffering from this pandemic. Their patients are suffering from this pandemic, and they feel it's their moral obligation to do something about it. The investments that are being made by governments help them to balance out some of the risk and opportunity cost to make it possible to take things forward. But we shouldn't think that this is a quote unquote windfall for many of these, uh, these large companies. The last thing I'll say is I just wanna clarify a comment that I made earlier about what we will and will not know at the time that we launched the first vaccines. We will know a lot about safety and effectiveness about vaccines because we're taking these vaccines through very large clinical trials that are the same size eyes as the clinical trials we would normally conduct for vaccines, at least as currently planned. There are a few things we won't know fully, like the duration of protection and the possibility of very rare side events and we side effects. And we do need to monitor for that over time. And as you suggested, we have uh, in many places mechanisms so that if a, an individual is unfortunate enough to have one of these rare 
side effects, that there is a compensation scheme available for them that uh, is triggered so that they can be supported. And that is the kind of approach that I think uh, many of us think would be applicable here. Fantastic. Let me let me turn down to John Arna. Um, you you know you've had a, a role both in in your in the Norwegian government and a role as the founding um, the, the founding CEO of, of CEPI. So you you might be sort of uniquely situated to answer a question about vaccine nationalism. So one way you know we've been hearing a lot of people wringing their hands uh, about the the. the potential vaccine nationalism and, and, and countries guaranteeing rights for their citizens first. But another way to think about it is that, you know, these are democratically elected governments. So why shouldn't democratically elected governments prioritize their citizens first? Well, I think that's that's a really I mean, important question, definitely. And in a way, if you see health as the human rights issue, uh, we know that it's actually sovereign states that are the guarantors of human rights, and, and they have a responsibility to protect and promote human rights uh, and health in their countries and among their citizens. Um, so it's a clear, not only a right, but a responsibility for governments to make sure to protect their citizens. But I think we need to see this not um, from a sort of too narrow perspective, because uh, we know that um, it's not only the um, health impact, direct health impact of COVID-19 that actually now are affecting uh, populations. It's the, all the indirect effects, both on other health issues that, of course, uh, have uh, uh, been less prioritized and, and people do not go to hospitals or, or they, their, their doctors need to, to reprioritize the activities. Um, we also have the large effects of the wider societal uh, measures on the economy. And we know that, of course, the economy and income is driving uh, also the well-being and health of individuals. Uh, so when governments make decisions and considerations related to uh, vaccine access, they need to have this broad perspective in mind. Um, they need to understand that this uh, can only be sort of solved as a challenge for my population if we can solve it as a global community uh, because many of these risks are related to the interdependence of states and populations across countries uh, we know that without actually handling this pandemic globally we will not be able to rest and not be able to rest assured so that's why i believe that countries uh, need to take sort of a staged approach to how they see vaccine as a tool to be used uh, in their population and how it can be used uh, globally. Um, and in many ways, it's very similar to what Somia mentioned as the idea of the COVAX facility. Um, it is uh, that governments would needs in the first stage to think that the vaccine is first and foremost a tool to avoid the most important health impacts at, on individuals. So that means we need to uh, vaccinate high-risk individuals, so, so the, the, the groups that have high risk to severe disease, as well as health personnel who put themselves at risk to the benefit of others. I think that's a, a morally sort of obligation for societies to, then to, to protect these frontline workers. But having done that, it actually makes more sense to make sure that also other countries are able to do the same than, tr than starting to vaccinate all of your population. And by actually then contributing to other um, governments being able to do the same, they will also be able to sort of reduce their measures, uh, in, increase the well-being of their people, and th this will boost the economy. And, and today, actually, I believe we have uh, more severe health impact of the, the, the economic effects of the pandemic than the direct effects of COVID-19. So that's why I believe that the, a national, a, a government can have a national responsibility perspective, but still acting uh, internationally and collectively to, to handle this pandemic. It's not an either or. Right. And, and Maya, can I just say quickly to that, you know, um, uh, President Trump uh, continues to um, kind of use the language of, of the China virus or the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus. And he's, he's doing that um, for just kind of good old fashioned racist and xenophobic reasons and also to deflect attention on to kind of, you know, our administration's abysmal uh, failure over the last um, six months to 
respond to COVID and also, um, I think, as you've heard, to kind of prepare effectively for something like this that would happen because WHO certainly, you know, for at least five years has been um, kind of warning the world about it, disease X. Um, but in some ways, perversely, as I was just like listening to your question and listening to uh, John Arno's response, he also is effectively like reminding people every day of how vulnerable we are to what happens you know, around the world, including in a uh, city that probably most Americans hadn't heard of um, before January, and now probably most Americans have. And so I would hope that, um, you know, that could be kind of the, the, the jumping off place of helping to now explain to, you know, people in high income countries who we need to be putting pressure on their governments to be making responsible choices um, about equitable vaccine distribution, to invest in the mechanisms that John Arno and Sonia spoke about, um, but to help explain that kind of this, this global solidarity isn't kind of just a rhetorically good thing to do. It actually very much is in our own kind of public self-interest to do to kind of understand that our kind of local public health is intimately connected to, to global public health. And so, you know, I hope if there's any kind of uh, positive um, and maybe just because I'm such a kind of inveterate optimist that can emerge from this painful language that President Trump continues to use. It is hopefully that it kind of is creating psychological space for um, Americans to support, hopefully, kind of the next government in having a more um, kind of uh, greater understanding of how kind of our, our national and local interest is so intimately connected to our, our global public health. Right, so you, uh, Chelsea, just preempted a question that came up particularly to you about the narratives around uh, communication, uh, around vaccination and, and government strategies about it. So um, so well done. Um, I want to return to um, Rajiv for a moment on the, the question of equitable access. Um, and, and Somia, maybe you want to jump in here as well. Um, you know, we have a couple questions coming through about the cost again of the vaccine and how to how to ensure equitable access given those costs. Um, Suba says in the, in the chat that, um, that Moderna has stated that the cost is going to be uh, $50 per shot. It would be a two shot vaccine. Um, and that that translates to um, more than the average uh, annual per capita income in India. Um, so can you just, do you, have you thoughts about how to ensure equitable access given, given some of these um, early indications of cost? Let me uh, let me just first make a, a, a statement about the the principle. You know, throughout history, we have had inequitable access to essential health commodities. This was the reason that Gavi was created to bridge that divide, and has been extraordinarily successful. CEPI was created for similar reasons to ensure that when epidemics emerged, that in developing countries or or um, high risk areas, that there would be a vaccine available quickly. We're in the midst of the greatest crisis of a generation. And we have a situation where on an emergent ba emergency basis, every single country in the world needs a vaccine. We have an opportunity as a world to set the moral tone for the future, for the rest of the century. How we be behave with regard to access in this pandemic will uh, set the bar for how we deal with access for all essential health commodities, even in the non-emergency context in the future. And so I think we, uh, the world needs to consider the gravity of the decisions before us. Now, with regard to how we can assure equitable access, and I know Samia has thought deeply about this, um, there are models that adjust the, 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 the pricing of vaccine uh, according to a country's ability to pay or a country's wealth that is sometimes called tiered pricing. That's one way to address the issue of pricing as it relates to access. Uh, let me say, in, in, in this case, whereas I have been speaking for myself, let me speak for the pharmaceutical industry. There is a, uh, a clear position that, of support for equitable access. And in my personal view, price should never pay, uh, should never be a barrier to access to COVID vaccines, full stop. And we all need to work together to assure that that's the case. Right, the Somia, there's a um, you know, particular, just to, you, I've posed some questions to both both you and Rajiv, but um, a particular question in the chat um, by by Nidi, who says that you know you you mentioned that we need 32 billion and that we only have three billion collected so far. So um, the question is about 
the persuasiveness of global health security as a global public good, is that a persuasive argument um, uh, in getting governments to commit? Or, and if not, what would be persuasive in, to your mind? Well, um, I don't know, it's maybe not persuasive enough, but if this pandemic hasn't taught us that you know, the whole world is so interconnected, it's no longer possible to feel that if you do things within your own borders, that if you invest in health systems in your own country and, and, and do everything to, to make that as robust as possible, it does not uh, mean that you're going to be protected because especially viruses, they don't respect borders and um, they're gonna travel with all this international travel that we have today. So I think health security of a country depends on health security everywhere. Like we see now that if you, if you vaccinate your own citizens and the virus is still raging in other parts of the world, the world is not going to go back to normal. And so there's, there's a huge economic argument for doing the right thing, but maybe we haven't made the case well enough. Like I said before, it's, it's opposed to the trillions that the world is losing this investment is, is small, relatively small, even though $32 billion is a lot of money, but compared to what's going on in the world and, and what could, if this is prolonged, you know, the kind of losses that are going to be seen. So, so there is also enlightened self-interest, I think, as Chelsea uh, talked about, that even if, you want, if you're more interested in protecting your own citizens, even if you take a nationalistic point of view, you still need to be able to protect and, and do something to make sure the virus is under control in other parts of the world. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to make the, the change, the difference that you want. The economy will still be stuck. Air travel will still not, you know, uh, take off. Many things will, will not be able to return to normal. So I think people need to realize that it is in their own interest, in the interest of their own citizens and their own country to make sure that there is equity in, in whatever is done, especially in the new tools and uh, vaccines that are going to be produced, because that's the only way to solve the problem in, in your country, if you are able to also contribute to solving it for the world. Right, so we're, we're, we're running up against the, the last kind of couple of minutes here. So I'm gonna ask each of you for you know, any kind of closing thoughts you uh, want to um, want to share with us. Um, we have uh, Dom Stevens who's asked, how do each of you imagine this period of history will be remembered um, in the future looking back? Um, and uh, there are a couple points that we haven't been able to get to um, for, for Chelsea about the role of of schools um, and uh, whether it's we should be thinking about sending children back to school, particularly as you've written um, books for for uh, for school aged children. Um, so I don't know if you want to address that in your in your closing comments. So um, let me just um, kind of start with you, um, Somia. Do, you know, just any any other things that you want to react to, and and maybe to address in closing this question about how do you think this period in history will be remembered or maybe how you hope it will be remembered. Yes, I mean, obviously I think we all hope it will be remembered for global solidarity. And I think what's unprecedented has been the degree of scientific collaboration that we've seen, the willingness of both the public and the private sector to come together to solve the, the big questions. Uh, the product development of course is one aspect, but there are many other things that we needed to learn about this virus. And so there we've, I think we've really seen very good co uh, collaboration and coordination. Um, I do hope that this will also extend into what we've talked about in, in, in that investing for the tools that will bring an end to the acute uh, phase of, uh, of the pandemic. And the other thing just in closing, I'd like to mention is the concept of the solidarity trials that were launched by uh, WHO. And this is again, I think a new way of doing things where the world actually, because this disease is all over the world, coming together to take part in clinical trials and research that helps to answer the questions uh, in a timely manner 
uh, in a collaborative manner. And you know, we've done this therapeutics trial. Hundred countries wanted to be part of it. Currently, there are about twenty-five countries that are participating. Most of them have invested their own resources into being part of the trial, and um, so we've been very successful in being able to answer a lot of questions on therapeutics. I hope the same thing can happen for vaccines as well, where the world decides to come together and collaborate, because that can really accelerate answering some of the questions. So perhaps it won't be remembered for, for global, unprecedented global cooperation, particularly in science. Rajiv? Oh, you're still muted. Thanks, thanks, Maya, for uh, for for inviting all of us here today. And I I would be remiss if I didn't uh, congratulate the University of Oxford on the tremendous speed and success of your vaccine candidate, as uh, John Arne mentioned in the beginning. This is giving all of us great hope for for vaccines in general that we'll be able to to get something quickly to protect the world from this virus. I think that uh, this entire experience has highlighted um, the the criticality of science and technology in advancing the interests of all people. And what is ironic is, as I've said in, in, in the US, is, is that we've, we have this, this uh, mistrust in some segments in, in science when in fact, part of the reason America is the country that it is, is because of science. We often talk about democracy, but democracy couldn't have done it alone. It was democracy and science and technology and many other things. And I do hope that we will return to the, our foundations in that regard and trust in science and, and do the right things. I would also point out that um, the starting gun for this pandemic uh, in January was the same for the entire world. Everybody was given warning at the same time. And different countries have performed differently. And it, interestingly, when we look at the economic standing of a country, or if we look at metrics of preparedness for a pandemic that had been generated previously, they don't correlate with performance. It turns out that leadership and a focus on doing things that are grounded in science made all the difference. And the last thing I would say is that we will all be judged by how we support the most vulnerable in this pandemic, whether it be high-risk populations, those on the front lines, whether they be healthcare workers or, or working in, in, in warehouses where they're at greatest risk uh, or in developing countries, we will be judged. And I do hope that we will, we will take this challenge and, and pass this test to set the new standard for the rest of the century. So Rajiv, the things we, we will be remembered in part for um, a turnaround in, in trust in science and, uh, and to some degree, uh, the protection of the vulnerable. Chelsea. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just will echo um, the hopes of, of Rajiv and Somia. I certainly hope that we will be remembered for um, global solidarity. And I certainly hope that we will be remembered for, as Rajiv said, a kind of a, a, a return to kind of trusting in science and being kind of guided by evidence. I certainly hope that we will um, kind of privilege uh, you know, in this country and in every country kind of, and support kind of uh, leadership that does the same, that kind of understands why global solidarity is important to um, kind of the health of people in their own societies, um, certainly in kind of in democratic countries. And I hope um, the same is true for kind of leaders who are, who are guided, um, guided by, by science and evidence um, and kind of have enough a humility to recognize that that guidance may have to shift as the science and evidence um, kind of develops, because I think that's been a, kind of a, a special challenge here in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, it, in the United States, we passed the kind of a deeply ignominious and uh, painful horizon of 150,000 lives lost um, to this virus, at least those that we've counted, and we know probably the toll is so much greater, Maya. So, you know, I hope too um, that uh, there will we will be remembered for a, a, a significant course correction to help kind of save more lives and especially as Rajiv said to really protect the vulnerable and I would add um, kind of our incarcerated populations to those that uh, Rajiv mentioned um, and I hope too that we'll kind of be remembered for this kind of uh, reckoning and then recognition of the need to invest more kind of in public health I mean unlike when Rajiv was uh, kind of at his position in the in the White House over the last decade you know we've lost of hundreds of millions of dollars in funding kind of for the CDC at a global level and certainly for state um, health authorities. And just finally on the school point, I really, really wish that people um, understood 
um, that if we wanted schools to open or if we wanted kind of sports to be played, we need to um, kind of eliminate community transmission. I wish people understood kind of that that was the, um, the, the quickest way through, if you will, un until we get to vaccine. And we don't seem to really understand that here. Um, in the U.S. and so I would I would hope that kind of um, that would happen too because if that were our guide we may not be able to open schools you know in August um, as some schools are slated to open but we could certainly open schools in October if if we had that kind of uh, laser laser focus um, we don't yet but but I live in hope that we might and Maya just thank you uh, to you and to Oxford and um, for convening us here today. Yeah, so so I think Chelsea, what you what you're really highlighting for us as you continually underscored the word hope, right? Is that this is how critical this moment is, and thinking not just through the science, but through the politics and how um, and how we we really think about the um, the nature of cooperation at this moment, um, what that looks like institutionally, what it looks like in terms of narratives, what it looks like in terms of social media responsibility. John Arna, over to you for the last word. Well, thank you. I think it's an excellent question and uh, from Dom. Um, and I, I think that uh, my perspective is in a way that we, uh, we uh, as communities, we as citizens, we as policymakers actually have a choice to make. Uh, and that we are able to shape now in the coming months. And actually it's, it's that urgent to shape how the future will actually look uh, upon what we did uh, because now we have technology a tool that most likely will be there uh, by early 2021 uh, hopefully at least um, and i think it can be a tremendous success and actually demonstrate what somia and rajiv and chelsea now do speak about uh, if we are able to make sure that it's implemented and fully used but it can also be a political disaster internationally if it's not there at the volume we need. It's not there for the population who are vulnerable and who need it. Uh, and I think actually politicians do have some very important decisions to make over the coming months, because it's at this time they need to make decisions that are, can actually shape their future's view on what we did early 2021. Um, so I urge, in many ways, the, the governments who have expressed at heads of state level to prove their solidarity to equitable access uh, and that they need to make measures to make that happen. The proof of the pudding lies in its eating, I guess it's called, said in the UK. Um, and a technology is not enough. We, we, and science is not, is not enough. We actually need to make sure that it's delivered to everyone. So thanks to Maya for excellent sharing and, and to the other panelists. It was great to be a part of this discussion. Great. Well, let me then close uh, by thanking, thanking the audience for their participation and their fantastic questions. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, let me thank the fantastic team at the Lovatna School that's helped support put, putting them together this event. And finally, let me support, let me thank um, all of the panelists, um, you know, from, from the East Coast of the United States to, to India and with a with couple of us in Europe in between. Um, you, all of you epitomize the, um, I think the, the global cooperation that we've seen and that Sonia said we, we hope this moment is remembered for. Um, and um, and for sh lending us your your time and your thoughts um, and for underscoring the importance of thinking through the politics of uh, vaccine um, distribution and production over the next few months. So thank you to you all, and um, and we hope to see you again at the Bobotic School. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Maya. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>